Now, 20, chapter 26 is an enormously important chapter, and the first verse is very impressive. We, we mentioned it before. Came to pass the rising generation could not understand the words which Benjamin spoke, being little children when Benjamin gave it. Well, the first thing we notice is the tremendous speed with which things move in the Book of Mormon. These, this generation was alive in the time of King Benjamin, and all that has happened, you see. It impresses one how much has happened in how short a time. Now, Matthew Arnold, in what's been considered the greatest work of literary criticism in the English language, says there are four things that make Homer preeminently great. First, he is preeminently rapid. Second, he is preeminently noble. Third, he is preeminently simple and direct in content, what he tells. And fourth, he is eminently simple and direct in language. By far the hardest of these to achieve, that no other great epic poet ever achieved, is the rapidity. Milton drags on all day just to have uh, Satan turn around twice. <clears throat> but not Homer, he rushes along, and the Book of Mormon moves like an express train, you see. You start right from the first chapter, right from the first event, right from the beginning. Nephi plunges right into it, and he never starts, he never stops going. The book just moves like lightning all the way through. And that's a feat that nobody can accomplish that doesn't know exactly what's going on, or doesn't have a document before him or something, because nobody can get away with that. But look how much has happened, and how much is going to happen, and how fast it happens. But it's the situations that's significant here. Notice this. Being little children at the time, they didn't believe the tradition of their fathers. Well, why shouldn't little children believe the tradition of their fathers? What's wrong with that, you see? The little children I know, they, they took it from me, most of them. And uh, I know in my family, on both sides, the children, the grandchildren have far stronger testimonies than the children did. Being young, I, was, is that going to stop you from getting a testimony? What goes on here? This is very well explained here and exactly the reason for it. <coughs> what is happening here is this, and we'll see it comes out very clearly in this chapter. And it begins in the preceding chapter. Notice it's 4 to 7 here, what the situation was here. In verses, in chapter 24, verses 4 to 7. Yeah, it's way back there, yes, yeah, not the preceding chapter, the one before that. The Lamanites and Nevites over a wide area started mingling freely and exchanging goods and services and information. Were friendly and so forth. About 35 miles, 35, 50 miles, how far is it south on the main highway to Flagstaff from Hopi Land, from where you turn off there at the gap, uh, is Waputka. It's, it's quite near the road, and it's a very ancient ruin. It's an ancient ruin, quite extensive, and all sorts of junk has been found there. It was the center of a network of roads or trails, and there you find beads, and you find pottery, and you uh, find basket work, and you find all sorts of things, metal work, that come from all over, from the Great Lakes region, from up the north, from down Central America, from the Central Plains. They find artifacts, well, fragments and things from everywhere. In other words, there's a great trading center. Pe people play, uh, traded very widely there. So in ancient times, they did move around that far north. We know that they, ha they did in the south because you find, uh, you find different types of, of uh, work, well, all up and down the Andes and, and all through Mexico and so forth. There's all sorts of evidence of trade. That's a very important thing, of course. And uh, so they had this business civilization here. And no, we're told in the seventh verse, with the business civilization and prosperity, crime began to flourish. Yes, yes. They did increase, we're told, in riches, in trade, in cunning, in all manner of wickedness and plunder, sophistication. And the connection is made quite clear, for example, a little later on, in the case of, of the, the sons of Mosiah. Well, in the seventh verse here, at the eighth verse of the 27th chapter, we're looking ahead just for a moment, see what the situation is there, where it tells us, they became a large and wealthy people. And notice the sons of Mosiah, no less than Mosiah, the great Mosiah, the king, his sons, and the oldest son of Alma, only the oldest son of Alma, uh, joined the, the Hellfire Club, the Smart Alec Club, and uh, reject the gospel completely. They wouldn't take it from their parents. That's a, that's a remarkable thing, isn't it? But you notice what it was. It says it's right in the, same, in the same breath with there being a large and wealthy people. Then the next verse says, and the kids weren't taken in by religion anymore. 
This sort of thing, you see, becomes a, a corrupt society. It says, the sons of Messiah were numbered among the unbelievers, and also one of the sons of Alma. He became a very wicked and idolatrous man. These kids were wicked, <coughs> were rich, <coughs> excuse me, rich, sophisticated, cynical. <coughs> they spoiled a lot of things. <coughs> For your special delectation, business is not the flower of civilization, but of barbarism. It's the way of the barbarians. It's born of the wandering tribes, the plundering tribes of the steppes. Now, our, our Viking ancestors from the north, one of their first settlements was, was Elphinstone on the north coast of Scotland. And uh, my genealogy now turns up that there were uh, three, there was, at Elphinstone, it was, a, it was a town that had to mine, and there were three Hugh Nibley's in succession were mayors of Elphinstone. <laughs> I just discovered that a year ago, or so, less than that. But uh, all sorts of things happened. But they, they went around plundering and looting and taking everything they could. If you want to know what found out, know what went on there, read the Orkney saga. That's a wonderful thing about what they did. But they plundered and they looted and they burned each other's houses down and so forth. But they always carried a set of scales with them for business, for weighing precious metals, jewels, and gold, and things like that. They were traders every inch of the way, uh, and trading and business and looting all went together. You grabbed what you could grab, is the idea. And the chiefs of the tribes across the steppes, they lived by plunder and exchange. Well, the, the, the ring giver, that's what's good, can you remember how the, how the uh, Beowulf starts out and so forth? Everybody goes out and plunders, and the king has the richest plunder, and then he divides it among them, and there's a good deal of argument about who has the most honor and so forth. They get very clever in banking arrangements and keeping their books. You owe me so much, I owe you so much. It's kept in the, in the barbaric societies, you see, your meat of honor depends on your share of the meat. It's a very interesting thing. The Egyptian word for it goes back there. And the Egyptian form, you are, is you are, is a picture of a thigh of beef, a side of beef that a person gets his, his particular lot. Well, anyway, the, uh, these semi-nomads, they have to have their wealth portable. Of course, you're traveling around, and it was the weather, the bad times that forced them to move. It gets everybody moving, and everybody's plundering everybody else. And that's what happened in Lehi's time. Remember, 600 BC, all the world starts moving. The whole ancient structure collapsed. That was last semester, but everybody started to go, and they started looking for homes and colonizing. But they have to have your wealth is portable and in concentrated form, you see, namely precious metals and jewels. They get great on collecting that. Well, that's the theme. The gold and the jewels is the theme of whether it's Raiders of the Lost Ark or whether it's the theme of, uh, of any of our primetime TV, the, the detectives and the murder and so forth. Now drugs has a big place to play, but these valuable small mobile items are the thing, are the soul of business, and they make for ferocious business <coughs> customs and so forth. And uh, they kept jealous accounts of what they gave and how much is always counted. And of course, they dress in gorgeous attire. We say barbaric dress, as far as that goes. And again, this was a necessity. The women traveled, as you can see from the National Geographic and so forth. The women traveled and <coughs> among all this sort of people, <coughs> including the Indians, with all their personal wealth hung around their necks, usually in, punk, in gold coins with holes through them. You see all sorts, all the Asian, like everywhere you go you find this is, this is characteristic with uh, all this splendor they carry around with them. And uh, their whole personal wealth is strung about their person, so that it's mobile, they can always put their hands on it. And, but by contrast, you notice, the inhabitants of the civilized cities, like the Ionian cities and the Egyptian cities, Everybody was content with wearing a simple white or gray robe with a little tasteful decoration or a fringe, and that's all. They all wore basic white in, <coughs> in Athens, as a matter of fact. And, and uh, the only people who did well in Rome, in Rome you could be, uh, you know exactly what a person's status was. If it was brown, if he was a servant, it was white. And it was, if it was white with a toga picta on it, then he was a big wheel. Toga clavata, then he was a senator, and so forth. So. Uh, we say a business civilization does not come, is not the fine flower of, of uh, civilization, or is civilization a product of business? It's the other way around. It's essentially barbaric. And this is what happened to these people. This is, a, this is what it's describing now. Now, <coughs> leave us proceed happily here. We got down to the fifth verse. And now this is a very, I say this is one of the most important chapters, every chapter is the most important. But this tells us about the church, what the church is for, why we have to have a church. The problem is this, now you notice, in the reign of Mosiah, there were not half so people, uh, the dissenters weren't half as numerous as the people of God. 
But because of dissensions among the brethren inside the church itself, this is what caused the, the uh, apostates to grow in number. It was dissensions, notice in the fifth verse here, dissensions among the brethren. They became more numerous and finally they outnumbered them. And it came to pass that they did deceive many. <coughs> they deceived the members of the church. I mean, these outsiders, these uh, apostates were able to get away with it. How? Well, they used it, says they, with their flattering words. They came on strong with all sorts of flattering words. I mean, words flattering <coughs> the intellect and so forth. You can't believe that infantile stuff. You don't believe that stuff. The interesting thing about my friends, of course, they don't believe the gospel, but the interesting thing is they don't believe I believe it either. They can't believe that I actually believe this stuff, you know. It's an interesting thing. And uh, it's one of the, the tests. They're, they're so naive about it because they don't know a blessed thing about anything. Well, <coughs> Those who were in the church and caused them to commit many sins, again, you see. And therefore it became expedient that those who committed the sin, now this has happened, if you're a member of the church and you have <coughs> accepted some of this uh, smooth talk and you started uh, misbehaving yourself, this we can't. We can't uh, quibble about these things. This, this, this old puritanical strictness just doesn't go. You see, we're an enlightened people. We're emancipated. And if you started that and we're still a member of the church, then you'd be admonished by the church. You notice in the first verse they tell you to get back on the track again. You didn't like that, of course. And the teachers. Notice we have priests and teachers in this next verse, in the seventh verse. It was the teachers that would catch on to it first, of course. And the teachers reported them to the priests. I guess they'd be, we'd call them home teachers in this case, wouldn't you? Notice it says they were delivered up to the priests by the teachers. And the priest brought them before Alma, who was the high priest. What could the, what could the, t the priest do? The teacher wouldn't have anything to do with it. This is a hot potato, and nobody will take it, you notice. And then it is handed to the priests, and they go up to Alma, the high priest, will take it to the general authority. He should know. But Alma didn't know this is another surprise. And I thought, Alma wasn't aware of what had been going on at all. Now, oh, that's a surprising thing. Uh, why not? Shouldn't he have known that and so forth? Alma didn't know concerning. There were many witnesses against them. But Alma didn't know about what was going on. Was, was he ever naive? Uh, the, and, but there were many witnesses against them. See, they kept saying, well, he was apparently reluctant to believe it. They had to pour on the witnesses. She says, Alma didn't know concerning them, but there were many witnesses against them. The people stood and testified of their iniquity in abundance. It took a lot of pressure to make Alma give in there. Alma was a real idealist, wasn't he? He didn't want to get involved in this thing, yet he was the head of the church. And he was troubled. It upset him. Notice the next verse tells us that Alma was upset by this sort of thing. He hadn't known. If I had known about this. Well, this is a common thing, too. There are the emperor, uh, uh, Constantine, for example. We often find, well, a good example. I I've cited it before here, is uh, measure for measure. The Duke wanted to know what was really going on in his kingdom, and the only way he could find out was to go put on a disguise and go around and see the same thing with, uh, uh, <coughs> with Harun al-Rashid. He had his faithful servant, Jafar, who was a gigantic black man, and uh, he, to find out what was going on in the kingdom, he would disguise himself, and they'd go out by night and circulate and visit all the, the gambling halls and so forth and so on. They did it for fun as much as anything because Harun al-Rashid was very much bored by what was going on. But uh, the king has to disguise himself and go around if he wants to know what goes on, you see. <coughs> king Lear, the same thing. Remember when he's no longer king, when he's kicked out, he's, uh, <coughs> he hears about it. Then he goes out and mingles with some of the people in the cold winter time. Poor Tom's a cold and so forth. And he said, if I had known what had been going on all this time. But he was the king. It never got to him. You see. And so it pays for kings to be demoted and look around a while, and this is what happens. And, incidentally, I imagine that's why the, uh, the British monarchy has remained so popular, because they do get down the circle. Prince Charles today is very much interested in social affairs and everything else, and, and Edward VIII, what made the trouble was Edward VIII got too sympathetic. He was Prince of Wales, and he got too sympathetic with the Welsh coal miners. He found out what their troubles were, started feeling with them, and certain industrial interests didn't like that sort of thing, and there was a lot of trouble. Well, anyway, Alma didn't know, so you'll have to excuse him for not knowing, and it took some pressure to convince him, but when he was convinced, he was upset. He was troubled in his spirit, and he says, well, I have to take this to the king. <laughs> He's passing the buck, too, see? So he said to the king, well, there are many whom I've brought before thee who are accused of their brethren. I have to take that of divers iniquities. Now, 
What can the church punish them for? And how can the church punish them? That's what this chapter is going to tell us. He doesn't know what to do about it, and neither does the king. Because they're civil offenses. Now, here he says, I have brought them before thee that thou mayest judge them according to their crimes. See, to their civil offenses. If they commit a crime, the church doesn't punish them. The king punishes and the government punishes them. Uh, if they haven't committed a crime, what can the church do about it? They're, they're not criminals. So we're going to decide that, you see. And what does the king do? The king passes it on, too. It's a hot potato for him, just as well. Notice the king, but the king said unto Mosiah, Behold, I judge them not, therefore I deliver them right back to you, into thy hands to be judged. <coughs> so the king passes them right back to Alma again. <coughs> See, the question is, what action should I take? The answer, it is through the church that God intends to deal with man. The human race is admittedly lost and bemused. And this is the closest exposition you'll get of the purpose of the church. Why do we have to have a church? Why do you have to have a ship? Why do you have to have a house? Well, we have no choice but to live together. That's the reason. You see, if we were living alone, we wouldn't need one. But since we all have to live together, even Cain had an entourage wherever he went. And so we're living in a community with each other. And we'll see what comes of that. And Alma is not the typical boss, you notice. He doesn't, he's not the manager that knows exactly what to do and does the wrong thing. <coughs> the spirit of Alma was troubled, he's worried. He was afraid that he might do the wrong thing. A very humble man. He poured out his voice to God. Notice he says he feared that he should do wrong in the sight of God. Well, how many leaders, how many great men, bosses, managers, and so forth, are in constant fear that they'll do wrong when they're faced with a problem and so forth. They may not know how to solve it, the idea of doing wrong. Nobody does wrong anymore, as you know. They deny all guilt. They're, no matter what you've done, you make a cut with your hand in the till, you deny every charge because the lawyers tell you always, only fools plead guilty, always say nothing. Uh, you're innocent. Well, anyway, he's worried about it. He feared that he should do wrong in the sight of God. And so he poured out his soul. This is where we take it to the Lord, of course. And the voice of the Lord came to him and telling him. This is in the manner of the Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith wants to know, and he asks. And it came to him, and thou art blessed because of thy exceeded faith, faith in the words alone of my servant Abinadi. Now, what about childish faith? What about being gullible and so forth? He believed in the words alone. He saw no evidence, no proof or anything like that. And it wasn't the word of God, it was the words of Abinadi alone that he believed in. Uh, oh, what's going on here? Why is there merit in this? Uh, Stendhal, the great Christopher Stendhal, when he was here, uh, he's now Bishop of Lund, uh, the chief of the Swedish church, you know. And uh, <coughs> there was a lunch here, and uh, someone, uh, namely me, uh, quoted uh, Joseph Smith as saying, nobody was ever damned for believing too much. Well, he found that extremely offensive, extremely offensive, but if you come to it, everybody believes too much. There's not a person here who believes any, a single thing that's been absolutely proved, absolutely and completely proved, <laughs> gravitation or anything else. You have to believe all sorts of things that you can't possibly prove, and everybody believes it. Well, what's the point here, then? Uh, because you believed in his, words al in his words alone. I would emphasize the his. You were blessed because you chose, because of what you chose to believe, because of the things you chose to believe. Not by the act of believing, not by just faith, not by believing. You weren't blessed because you believe, but because you chose what to believe, you see. Because everybody chooses what to believe. The atheist is a very strong believer. He's, he's the most passionate arguer he can possibly find. But the positivists, uh, where will you find greater faith and firm conviction than among economists? No two of them agree, but boy, they can give you the straight thing. You, see, you find faith all around you. You must believe in something, and everybody does. But he says, blessed are you because of the things you chose to believe. You chose to believe in the things that Abinadi taught. He could have chosen all sorts of other things. So it isn't just because he's naive and gullible, but it's you're blessed because of what you choose to believe, and it's up to you to choose what you believe. Because I say everybody does. Uh, I'm sure I believe things. Well, you get that especially in politics. You see, you see, such a person is a great man, he can't sin or anything else. And, and another person say, well, what do you see in that crook? <laughs> and so forth. And this goes on everywhere. We have our convictions. So he's for, for believed. What he chose to believe were the words of Abinadi. And blessed are they because of their faith in the words alone which thou hast spoken. See, in the words alone. 
Faith in the words alone, I mean, that seems awfully shallow, doesn't it? Just to accept something on somebody's word. But they're not sec accepting it on somebody's word. They've chosen what they would believe. What rang the bell for them is what they believed, and that was blessed. And blessed art thou, and here's another thing, because we asked, it's often asked, what authority, what priesthood did Alma have to do what he was doing here? And he went ahead and did it alone. And here he's congratulated for it. He's congratulated for taking the initiative. Notice in the 17th verse. Blessed art thou, because thou hast established a church among this people, and they shall be established, and they shall be my people. He's going to accept them. But he went ahead and established a church. I say, for having the priesthood, he took the initiative, and the Lord said, that's good. He doesn't want to command in all things. And because thou hast inquired of me concerning the transgressor, we love to make moral judgments of others, but he doesn't. Alma would not do that. And he says, you're blessed because you've asked me concerning these things. Now thou art my servant, and I covenant with thee. Now, Alma is speaking for the church, and yet God always covenants with us as individuals, as we'll see in three verses after this. How could it be otherwise? Uh, well, is there a virtue in membership, in just, just membership of the... Can you be blessed because you're a member of anything? No, no. It's with yourself that the Lord deals with you alone. Only the individual participant. It's like a, an orchestra or a choir or a faculty or anything like that. It's a community, but everyone is, a, is an individual contribution, and he deals alone with the Lord. And here we have it here. Thou art my servant. I covenant with thee. Thou shalt have eternal life. It's between Alma and the Lord. And thou shalt serve me and go forth in my name and shalt gather my sheep. You see. So, who is, and then in the next verse he says, who is acceptable to me it should be acceptable to you. And he that will hear my voice shall be my sheep. And him shall you receive into the church. He says, shall ye receive into the church. For behold, this is my church. We're here all working together. If anyone wants to, to come back, he says, the door is always open. Whosoever is baptized shall be baptized unto repentance. Whosoever ye shall receive and shall believe on my name, him will I freely forgive. And if I forgive him, you must forgive him. So again, you see, the door is always open here. And with baptism, and I'll receive them again. And I will take upon me the sins of the world, for it is I that hath created him. See, I am the one that hath created him. And it is I that hath granted unto him that believeth unto me the, uh, unto the end a place in my kingdom. Notice what he says in the singular. I grant unto him that believeth unto me. He's not talking about the church as a whole here. To the individual. He says, Alma, the deal is between you and me, and I'll grant into anyone that believes unto to the end a, a place at my right hand. Here's a personal relationship. I'll grant to that individual who believes on me. Here's your atonement, you see, which is a place at the right hand. That's the yeshiva. That means sitting down with God. Yeshiva. That's the word that's translated as atonement in the Old Testament. See? You see, when you go in and sit down with God, that's, a, that's yeshiva. That's an atonement. When you become at one, an individual again. Well, and behold, in my name are they called. If they know me, they shall come forth and have a place eternally. It's 100% up to the Lord himself. It's I will make the decision. I will decide who is righteous and who isn't, as he says in Isaiah. Don't tell me who are my sheep and who are not. Don't tell me you're the, who are the people of God, who are the good people and the bad people. He says, that's for me to decide. That's not for you to decide. Because it's the easiest thing in the world to say, are you on the Lord's side? We are God's people and so forth. This is the Lord's university. That used to make Harvey Taylor furious when he, when he first came here, calling this the Lord's university. <laughs> that was a gross insult to the Lord. Uh, not because of the quality of this or any other university. We had no right to say it. Let the Lord say that if that's so. Don't, don't pin that label on ourselves. We don't have the right to put medals on ourselves that way. It shall come to pass that when the second trump shall uh, sound, then they shall ne that, that the never knew me. Oh, this is the second one. That never knew me shall come forth and stand before me. Uh, and uh, again, if they absolutely refuse, I will deal with them personally again. But you notice the second trump and the second resurrection. Well, what's wrong with having to wait a few years in eternity. You're willing to wait for a second resurrection, six months or something like that. I'll graduate a little later. What's the difference? It's all the difference in the world. The second resurrection is a different type of experience. It's a different type of resurrection. Well, you'll be resurrected, of course, but you're, it's a different environment, a different setting. You're, uh, 
you're a different type of person from those that came out in the, in the first resurrection. It's not a matter of timing at all. It's a matter of quality what's going on here. And so he says, They'll, the second trump, that's fine. They that never knew me before shall come forth and stand before me. And they that know that I am the Lord their God and that I am their Redeemer, but they would not be redeemed. Remember we meant that before? I was nice to them, but you, I was nice to you, but you would not. I warned you, but you would not. I commanded you, but you would not. The same thing, but would not be redeemed. Well, nothing we can do. He's not going to infringe their agency. Then I will confess unto them that I never knew them. You see, uh, they thought they could fool him. They thought he would be recognized anyway. No, I knew what was going on. He said, you never fooled me. Then I will, that's why he says, I will confess to them that I never knew them, because they were never behaving. They, they tried to put out, pull a fast one. Remember, God will beat us with a few stripes, and then everything will be all right. He won't notice what's going on here. Prepare to the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This is explained later in the Book of Mormon. So, now here's the answer to the question, you see. Uh, the teacher is asked a question, what do we do with these guys? The uh, priest asked the question, then they asked it to Alma, Alma asked it to the king, the king asked it back to Alma, he says, I don't know, what do we do? And Alma asked the Lord, and this is the answer to the question, what will you do to members of the church who will not, uh, well, who deny their testimonies, or, or who are making, tr well, this happens in the church all the time. If people who, uh, who don't want to be long but want to stay in. I know lots of people that are that way because they, they lose their audience. They have no prestige and nobody will listen to them once they're, once they're out of the church, once they're disconnected. So they always want to be connected with the church so they can get an audience. Huh? If, they didn't, if they weren't panning the church, they never could get anybody out at all. But all you have to do is start jumping on the church and then you can get somebody interested, somebody to listen to you. So they always uh, bring that up. <coughs> they always keep the church in the picture. And this is so, people that write books against it and so forth, they always want to keep their membership. As a matter of fact, Von Brody, for example, you, you can't find anything more hostile than that. But it's a very interesting thing. You know Von Brody? Um, let's show a show of hands. Who knows Brody's work? No man knows my history. Well, that's right. She wrote the book that became the standard work again on Mormonism. Of course, it's a fraud. But the interesting thing is she wrote this, this withering book. And uh, when Russell Rich was back east, uh, uh, she was very sick. And her husband called, uh, phoned them uh, to come. It was in New England Mission and minister to her. And it was a terrible night. And they had to drive 80 miles in this awful storm. They said, well, she doesn't believe it. Well, she says, don't ask that. Just come. He was Jewish, you know. Just come. So they, uh, they went out and ministered to her. And, uh, well, they, first of all, they went in and said, but uh, you don't believe in this sort of thing. Why did you call us? But she said, but I do believe in it. I do believe in it. She was very sick. Yeah. So they administered to it, and it brought her around. And the next time they visited her, she came up to them with a cigarette, gay and happy. Wasn't I silly the other night, she says, this sort of thing. So this is the thing you deal with. And uh, they will not, so what do you do with people like that? They're, they're still members, but they're not cooperating. And this is the answer. Therefore, I say unto you, if they will not hear my voice, the same will not be received into my church. The only thing you can do is excommunicate them. There's nothing else. No punishment, no penalty, no sentence or anything. Just excommunication. That's what they want after all. They're after. And then, but if a person has committed a sin, if he confesses his sins and repenteth in sincerity, 29th verse, of his heart, him shall ye forgive, for I will forgive him also. And as often as my people repent, I will forgive them the trespass against me. This is the good news of the gospel, because it is the gospel of repentance, you see. We're repenting perpetually here. If you're not repenting, you're not improving. And you shall also forgive one another your trespasses, because I forgive you too. And you must take his word for it, you see. The Lord says, you don't want to forgive each other? That, that's not for you. For verily I say unto you, he that forgiveth not his neighbor's trespasses, when he says that he repents, the same hath brought himself under condemnation. Well, he says he's repented, but he hasn't really repented, so you don't forgive him? No, that's not for you to judge, he says. He's condemned himself then. He, he, you know the guy's a hypocrite. You know, he's made trouble for a long time. So he says, oh, I'm, I'm repenting all right, and so forth, because <laughs> he wants to get back into the church and have some influence. And uh, you forgive him his trespasses. The Lord says forgive him. And if... When he says he repents, the same hath brought himself under condemnation. See, he's condemned himself then. If he said he repents and hadn't, you, you must take his word for it. 
because I say you must, you must accept him. And then if he hasn't, if he's been lying, he takes the consequences. He's brought himself under condemnation. Now I say unto you, go and whatsoever will not repent of his sins shall not be numbered among my people. He'll be struck off the records. And the 30th, and it came to pass that Alma wrote them down, made the records, and he kept them, like the Doctrine and Covenants, like the IQS here. Uh, and you notice the interesting thing, that he might judge the people of that church, because remember, he established his churches far and wide. He couldn't be in all of them and visit them. So there are various churches. That's why he established the preachers and so forth. And he wrote down for his particular branch, for the church he lived in, he wrote down the record for them. He wrote these words down uh, that he might judge the people of that church according to the commandments. So there are many communities of like-minded people, many churches here. Well, Alma wrote them down, that he might have them, and that he might judge the people of that church. And it came to pass that Alma went and judged those that had been taken in iniquity. It had to be their acts and so forth. <coughs> <coughs> the uh, church is not a corporation that answers for my beliefs. That's what St. Augustine taught, you see. He says, whatever the most people believe, we can believe, and believe it without any doubt at all, if the most people believe it. He says, I know that I'm a Christian inter quos et me, he says, because I'm received by them. Any community that receives me, then, they, then I'm sanctified. I receive my testimony because I identify themselves with the church. Of course, this is the doctrine of the Catholic Church. The church is an institution, is its own proof, its own evidence of divinity. The other, the theological and so forth, is actually secondary. You, you come on to that quite a bit. But... Uh, I'm a member of the church because I believe, but I don't believe because I'm a member of the church. It's another way around, you see. And in Catholic countries, it's very common. People believe what they can because of the church. And, uh, but if you have anything to do with the church, it's because you believe. They don't want, well, we go on here. Now, here we read the, the doctrine of the two ways. I have to move on here. Alma did regulate the affairs of the church, and they had peace and prosperity, and the church, they walked circumspectly. Now, Alma and his fellow laborers who were in charge of the church, they went diligently teaching and suffering. But look at this. Alma, with all his authority and everything else, they're being persecuted. Alma's being persecuted, going around teaching the others, making them a bad time. They're greatly outnumbered now. They've caused up a lot of dissent. They've caused a lot of concern cutting all these people off the church and so forth. There's real trouble here, and they've got enmity where they go. And it says here, as they went around the church, teaching the word of God in all things, suffering all manner of afflictions, they were persecuted by all those who didn't belong to the church of God. That's a, no obvious advantage in membership anymore, was there? You know, that didn't give you an advantage. Now, you see all these guilty people, as we said from Rochefoucauld yesterday, we can forgive those who wrong us, but never those we have wronged. And the apostates, apostates are really bitter, as you know. And these were bitter apostates, and they were numerous now. And uh, the uh, and they did admonish their brethren, and were also admonished. You notice it wasn't a case of dominant and submissive here. Just last night, I was reading a very interesting thing in Philo, Philo of Alexandria. Nobody ever reads Philo, but he says, "The tose esotes mater dicosine." Uh, Equality is the mother of righteousness. Very interesting thing, because it's inequality that start men fighting among themselves and abusing themselves and being uh, ambitious and climbers and uh, competitive and making dirty, uh, up dirty stories about each other and so forth. I mean mean things about each other and the like. Uh, my youngest son, to his great surprise, ends up managing a large uh, hotel in, uh, in Guam uh, and uh, some other things with it. He says, 95% of the problem of management is these troubles that people make for each other. There's all this sniping that's going on, all this ambition and so on. It's the reason they put, he's never, he's never, never took a business course in his life or anything like that. But the Japanese owners found they could trust him and so they put everything onto him and he says, that's the whole thing all the day long. If it, if it wasn't for that, management would be a breeze. But it's all the personalities, all this bitterness that goes on. It says here, they were admonished, they admonished their brethren and were also admonished by them. So it's this equality. There's not somebody laying down the law to you and you laying down the law to somebody below you or you lick his boots and somebody else does yours. Not that at all. There was this equality, and we're going to have a lot. That word equality occurs a great many times in the Book of Mormon. But I like that from Philo, where he says, isotes, isotes, that means equality is the mother, the mater of dikeosune, of righteousness. 
the uh, <clears throat> and or the sins which he had committed, being commanded of God to pray without ceasing and give all him thanks, give all thanks in all things. So this is the way you hold on. This is the way they keep going, is to pray to God without ceasing. How do you do it? Without giving, incidentally, again, praying to God without ceasing. Is this what the, uh, uh, the Arabs call the fatra? The fatra is when you never stop mentioning the name God, no matter whatever you do all day long. Well, that's when, you, when you're sawing, when you're walking, when you do any repetitive action, whatever, you just keep saying Allah, 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 Allah. Well, what do you mean praying without ceasing? Well, it's simply uh, you continue the practice of prayer. It's like saying uh, they went on having breakfast every morning without ceasing. That means they didn't eat breakfast all day and all night, but they did it without ceasing. Or uh, he uh, brushed his teeth. He constantly brushed his teeth. <laughs> Again, it doesn't mean 24 hours a day. The interesting thing is, of course, in, in the Semitic language, in Arabic, the only way you can say continually or continue or go on doing a thing is lazala or mazala. Uh, he did not cease. He did not cease mazala yaktabu. He did not cease writing. That means he wrote from time to time. He wrote regularly. Or uh, talma. Uh, he would say lazala mazala uh, talma. He didn't cease uh, studying or uh, yet to Gollum, that's the that's the active form. Yeah, or he didn't cease uh, educating himself and so forth. So we have these practices. We continue out. You see, I uh, um, <laughs> he continued to take his medicine, one pill a day, one aspirin a day. But he continues, and it doesn't mean constantly. So they continued in prayer without ceasing. That doesn't mean that they had a, a monastic. Uh, fanaticism here or anything like that. Well, now the next chapter. Now, the persecutions get pretty bad now. This gets very important, this next chapter. The persecutions here. The, uh, and here we recognize the source of pride and haughtiness, which were inflicted on the church by the unbelievers became so great that the church began to murmur. They didn't like it. And they complained to their leaders. This is going too far. And Alma said, lay the case before King Mosiah again. And Mosiah consulted with the priests. So they're having an another conference on these things. This is the clue to the apostasy, for example, uh, the Donatists on the right. How do you handle them? Uh, the gross case, well, of course, the usual thing was persecution. Just wipe them out. St. Augustine recommended. You see, the, the Donatists were making trouble. They had a different doctrine. They believed they weren't living the pure life of the early church, and the Donatists were cri strict, old-fashioned Christians. So uh, St. Augustine <coughs> recommended sol solving the Donatist problem by, by killing them all. And so 400,000 Donatists were slaughtered in North Africa because they thought, because they practiced Christianity in too strict a manner. Some business, yes, Brother Taylor? What exactly did... I know somebody's name now, Brother Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> what exactly did Messiah's priests do? Were they members of... Oh, they'd been appointed the by Alma. They'd been anointed by Alma, every one of them, it says. They had to be, yes. So were they like a group of high priests? Yes, no, they, were, they had a council. Of course, he brought them, they consulted together, yes. Remember, each one was appointed, they were appointed to, there could have been more than one, to, to lead the churches and so forth, and they, they come together here, they have a conference. So Alma yeah. was one of them. He was, he was the high priest, he, he was one to begin with, he was a priest of Noah, but it wasn't Noah that made him that. And the king sent a proclamation, <coughs> A, no unbeliever should persecute any member of the church. B, no member of the church should persecute anybody. And here we are. There should be no persecution among them, that there should be an equality among all men. There's your theme of equality. If we're going to have righteousness and judgment, there should be an equality among all men, a very hard thing to achieve. That they should let no... Are you, going to get, are you going to achieve this just by making rules? No, and it doesn't work, of course, as we'll see, but this is the best you can do. That they should let no pride nor haughtiness disturb their peace. Oh, first of all, in verse 3 here, the second point was, throughout all the churches, there should be no persecution among them. Yeah, there should be equality, and then the second is equality. They should let no proud or pride or haughtiness disturb their peace, that every man should esteem his neighbor as himself, laboring with their own hands for their support. Now, this shows where the inequality comes from. So it's an economic thing again, you see, laboring for their own hands. And this means that we do not have a professional priesthood. We're told that the priests, uh, back a little ways, we're told that the priests also labored for their support. <coughs> this, this recognizes the source of this pride and haughtiness, you see. Because remember, the people of the church were following the old order of Alma. Remember when Alma went out and followed and, and uh, established his modern model church in the wilderness where they were all humble and equal and so forth, just like the Qumran community, we saw that. They were driven out. They came 
to Zarahemla, but when he established the church there at the request of the king, it was on that order, with that same humility, with this rule that everybody should labor with his own hands, including the, church, the officers and everything else. And this is what they found offensive. And this is what led them to persecuting and so forth. This is what led to the pride and haughtiness of those uh, who were more successful because the others weren't striving for success. And the priest noticed the fifth verse, the priests and teachers would labor with their own hands for their support. Well, that they didn't like at all, you see. That's much too austere, much too old-fashioned, this equality. Uh, there are, a rich Hopi would be something to laugh at. There is no such thing. Hopi can't possibly get rich. If one has corn, we all have corn, and that's it, he says. And no professional clergy either, see. And what did they abound in? They abound in the grace of God. We're promised that if we do that sort of thing, but not willing to trust it, as Brigham Young says. We, people that say, I trust the Lord, but I feel better with money in the bank. Well, that may be true, but uh, that's not the way the Lord wants it. There began to be much peace in the land among them. And the Lord did visit them and prosper them, and they became a large and wealthy people. There is the, there is the uh, paradox again that these people that don't set their hearts on wealth, but don't strive for it at all, they become the large and wealthy people. And again, Brigham said, I could easily make this the richest people in the world, but I'm afraid it would destroy them. As a people, large and wealthy people, but it doesn't say they have large, great fortunes among them. Did you realize in 1987, we doubled the amount of billionaires in this country from 29 to 49. 49 billionaires? A million dollars a thousand times? You, know, you must have worked all day long for that. Must have worked overtime to have a billion dollars, a thousand million dollars. I can imagine that, you see. How could you earn, how could you earn ten thousand dollars a minute during the working day? Must be awfully hard working. Making shoes, etc. Repairing them. Well, a large and wealthy people. Now the sons of Moses. Now here you are. This is this is what the situation was. You notice, the sons of Mosiah were numbered among the unbelievers. Well, they were in the large and wealthy one. Their fathers were the leaders of the church in the kingdom, and they were in. They shared the wealth. Of course, they did. And he was called Alma, named after his father, and one of the sons, and the sons of Mosiah of all things, and Alma. Nevertheless, they became very wicked and idolatrous man. He did. He was a man of many words, very clever, very flattering, great talker and so forth. Uh, and uh, yeah, very popular. Speak flattering words to the people, therefore, it's like at a Beverly Hills party, you know, everybody speaks so flattering to everybody else. Therefore, he led away many of the people to do after the manner of his... He was the glass of faction. He was the Alcibiades. He was the Beau Bromel. Everybody imitated... Uh, everybody imitated Alma, apparently. This is, is the sort of thing that happens, the, the height of fashion. And this became a great hindrance to the popularity of the, teach, of the church, stealing away the hearts of the people, causing much dissension among the people. Now... This is the public. Why wasn't he locked up for this? Why wasn't he punished? Perfect right. He was the son of, of Alma, mind you. And he got the sons of Mosiah to doing the same thing. Why weren't they locked up? <coughs> Their parents had the highest authority in the state. Was it because they were being spoiled? They must have been spoiled in the, in the first place. Alma neglected some things because he didn't know about the troubles in the church and so forth. And uh, it came to pass, well, but they went around secretly too, making it even worse. He did go about secretly with the sons of Mosiah, seeking to destroy the church. What a strange, why would he do that, you see? To lead astray the people, well, just ask hundreds of apostates. I know plenty of them. Contrary to the commandments of God or even of the king. Uh, they're, here they're going together, this group, you know, like a gang of young men. The Egyptians call it a jamal, a gang of young men. There's lots of trouble like this in Egypt on the, on the village and town level, and the wisdom literature is full of it. These gangs of young fellows that go around disturbing things and having their fun, it's because they're full of spirits and so forth. But you have them, well, you know, two, ha two families, like both alike of dignity and Her Her Verona, the Capulets and those are the, just kids, the Capulets and the, the Montagues, having their public brawls in the street and having their parties and their wild goings on and raiding each other and so forth. And I say, then Alcibiades and the Hellfire Club that, that caused an awful lot of trouble in Athens. He was, I say, he was the, the flaming youth of the time. And uh, these people, uh, there's another familiar social phenomenon, in other words. The, it, was, it got so bad, right at the beginning of the Roman Empire, at the end of the Republic, it got so bad that August, uh, Augustus, the first emperor, established the Juventus. The Juventus were youth clubs. All over the empire, all over the Mediterranean was the Juventus, and, and you were 
uh, were required to join one, and they were activities of uh, athletic, educational, and so forth, and uh, Juventus, they made a big thing of the cult of the membership and the rings and the tokens and so forth to, to interest the youth, and, and some of them went pretty wild, and then uh, later among later, there were those in, for example, and you wore your badge and your signs and this thing, the wild haircuts they had in uh, in Crete, it was that the sign of this particular society that spread all over the land was, was to go stark naked. <laughs> that was not a very good defense, but that was, they were showing how smart, smart aleck they were. He defied all conventions and everything else. This is a familiar phenomenon in the ancient world, the Juventus. And I said unto you, they were going about rebelling and an angel stopped. The only thing that would stop him would be an angel. His father wouldn't do any good. I mean, they could appeal. I mean, you appeal to such people again and again. It's not going to help. He appeared to them as it were in a cloud. Now, this is an interesting thing. We mentioned before that what makes a miracle a miracle is timing. Uh, the, the damming up of the Jordan was a seasonal affair. The uh, drying up of the Red Sea, uh, where the bitter lakes come when the wind blows and so forth, that had happened before. Uh, the uh, bubbling up of the waters uh, where the, uh, the, cri the, the crippled man uh, was going to be healed and so forth. These things do happen, but they happen just at the right time. Well, the quails at Sugar Creek, when the pioneers crossed, they were going to starve to death, and all of a sudden came this tremendous growth of quails, and they were perfectly tame, and that saved their lives. The quails do that from time to time, or the grasshoppers and the seagulls. That was a rare event, but it does happen in the course of nature. But it's the timing of it that makes it a miracle. It time happens just when you want it to happen. Well, healing, for example, people get well, people get over various things, cancer and so forth, but when it correlates very closely with an administration, that makes it a miracle. And the same thing here. It was an earthquake. It was an earthquake country. The earthquake, and there was a lot of dust in the air. Uh, there was a cloud and a voice of thunder. You heard a tremendous war and an earthquake, and you notice they didn't understand. What they couldn't understand. They all fell down. It seems to be one of those periodic earthquakes. They all fell down to the earth and understood not the word which he spake to them. But these are correlated, you see. These are correlated from the other side. Which when you see, when the Lord can see or somebody else can see a comet on a collision course with something, he, you can predict it, you can prophesy it, you know when it's going to happen, you see it happening already. It, it's happened as far as you're concerned, it's absolutely certain. So the miracle and the miraculous, the element of time is a very important thing there, isn't it? And, and here it just happens that, and they fell to the earth and understood not the words he spake, but Alma understood. He passed out and the angel gave him a good, a good dressing down and talking to, why do you persecute the church of God? This is my church I will establish and nothing shall overthrow it, period. No, nothing shall overthrow it, save the transgression of my people. And you are transgressing, Buster, he says to him. You are transgressing. But notice, it is not absolute promise that it's my church. Therefore, since it's my church, nothing shall overthrow it. It doesn't say that at all. It says nothing shall overthrow it, save the transgression of my people. That can overthrow it. And we forget that. We say we have the guarantee and so forth and so on. Here's a long sermon without scriptures. He says, Alma has prayed with much faith concerning... See, see, Alma was terribly worried about his son. He couldn't appeal to him directly. He didn't do any good, so all he could do was pray to the Lord, just as he prayed about the wayward members of the church. And he's prayed at his answer uh, that the prayers of his servants might be answered according to their faith. Now, behold, can ye dispute the power of God? Does not my voice shake the earth? Can you not also behold me before you? I am sent from God. Now, he says, here is Moroni cites, just as Moroni cites the scripture to Joseph Smith, he cites past history here. They do that, remember, for our, for our prophet and learning, or to read from my Isaiah and so well, actually, time is up. He says, go thy way, and then remember. These are the things of, within recent history. These are the things that he would remember. This isn't crossing the Red Sea or Moses or even Lehi leaving Jerusalem. This is things he knew about from immediate experience, namely his father's. He remembered the captivity of thy fathers in the land of Hillam, where Alma was in charge. And they were in bondage, and he delivered them. Now I say unto you, go thy way and seek to destroy the church no more, that their prayers should be answered. And this, even if thou wilt of thy own will, be cast out. Very interesting here. <coughs> Why are apostates not satisfied to go on their own way and so forth? He said, go thy way. Seek to destroy the church no more. Even if you want to be cast out, don't seek to destroy the church. <coughs> so, and Alma and those that were with him fell again to the earth. The earth was shaking. It was giving him a bad time. 
So great was their astonishment, and the voice of thunder which shook the earth, always goes with earthquake, of course. But again, it's this correlation. We mentioned that before, remember, the, the uh, idea of, from the Talmud, that when men misbehave, the idea of nature, the, the girls dancing and so forth, and if you miss that, and then it said, and this, this, uh, from our, and, and uh, all this uh, trouble, the upset of nature, and uh, comes from our, what's the word he uses? <coughs> it is progeny of evil comes of our debate, of our dissension. This will produce it. If, if men misbehave themselves, nature will misbehave themselves. You can see why. See, because they're setting themselves against nature. We're saying all nature cooperates. The stars in their courses could take their courses, but you don't fight against their courses any way than, more than you drive the wrong way on the freeway at rush hour. That's what you're doing. If the nature is going its way and all things are obeying their proper course and you decide to set out in another way, you'll find yourself in real trouble.